you know, as we're opening up the house of God, we understand that as we open up this house, um, there are risks. There are risks to open up, uh, opening up the house. And, and there's risks also for Walmart to open up their stores. And there's risks for um, restaurants to open up. And, and there's risks for these strip clubs that are opening up. But why do they do it? They do it for a profit. Why are we opening up? We're opening up to reach one more person for eternity. The big difference is we have an eternal outlook. And of course, we're putting um, our lives always on the line. But serving God is always putting your life on the line for somebody else. The Bible says no greater love has one man. Of course, we're going to be we're going to be wise and and we're going to practice right protocol. But understand this: you can never reach reach your limit of what God has called you to your purpose. Trying to always just be safe. There's a time in your life that God calls you out of your comfort zone so you can reach one more soul for Jesus Christ. And that's why we've, we're opening up our homes. We're, we're opening up more space because I want to see more lives transformed for eternity. How many want to see more lives transformed for eternity? And tonight, some, I mean today, someone's life is going to be transformed. So today I want to talk about what's missing part two. And last week we covered relationships. Our relationship with God is what's missing. And today we're going to talk about a word called identity. What's missing is our identity. Have you ever heard this identity crisis? That there's a crisis of identity. I don't know who I am. And this was really discovered, this identity crisis issue, especially in the 60s and 70s. Um, hippies, were there any hippies here? Any part of the hippie movement? There you go, there you are. And, and what, what was really happening there? We're on a search to find ourselves. At the end of that search, we found out we were crazy. We found out we were drug addicts. It was all about drug, um, sex, rock and roll, <laughs> whatever else they had going on. But at the end, we found out that we're really messed up. And some of us found out that we were really depressed. But we never found the real answer. As I grew up, there was continual identity crisis because every single generation is looking to see where they fit in. And we had a few groups to belong to. Um, when I was a kid, there was the surfers. And surfers wore um, vans like you guys wear, some of you guys wear today. And we used to wear OP shorts and OP shirts. They sell it at Walmart now, but you used to have to go to a van store to buy OP. That was like a high level brand. And, and we were surfers in the Inland Empire riding around in skateboards. Never been to the ocean, surfed ever. But there was another group, and it was, it was the stoners. And the stoners were the ones that were in the bathroom smoking and smoking weed and just smoking cigarettes and getting high. And, and that was that group. And then we had another group were the gangsters and and they were the cholos, and some of you guys were the cholos, and you were part of the gangster group, and, and you used to buy all your clothes, and maybe you were a crip or a blood, you're part of the gangster thing, and you'd go to the swap meet to get all your clothes. You'd buy overso oversized pants, and, and the chanclas, and a little belt with your initials of your, of your last name right here, and and that's what you were. And, and then later on, you had the goths, so you dressed all in dark and depressed and be depressed. Some of you guys were part of that depressed group. And, and then they had the preppies and they had the jocks and, and, and then the punk rockers came out. I was a punk rocker for a minute because I used to like the, the mosh pits. That's what I used to like. But, um, but I, I was a cholo for a minute and I was a surfer for a minute. I was all of it. You know, I, was, I was trying to find my identity. And now it's even becoming more difficult because now we're forced to now choose our identity even in our belief. And, and now a big movement of atheism and I'm an agnostic and there's a lot of promotion on a message. Don't believe in God, do believe in God, um, be an agnostic, here's the evidence. And uh, many of us are now under the identity of a YouTuber that convinced you not to believe in God. And that has become your identity. And if someone says, what are you, what's your identity? Well, I'm a atheist. I'm a, a, an agnostic. And now we've gone deeper because now we're suffering an identity crisis with our gender and our sexuality. And now that's the big thing today. 
And, you know, right now I, w- I was kind of looking about just gender. Uh, we're, we're so confused right now. We have around 64 different definitions of gender. It's crazy. Like, what, I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're making up a gender for every single feeling and emotion or desire that you have. And go, that's a different gender. You know, but, but God created us with, with, a, with two genders, male and female. And this is what I've realized. If you don't take on the gender or the identity that God has given you, you'll try to create your own gender. And in that gender, it's only going to lead you to misery, pain, emptiness. Because you're trying to allow, you're letting the enemy define who you are when God's already defined who you are. And when we allow the definition of God's identity to be in us, we'll find the fulfillment, the peace, and the joy. Hear me out. And the reason I say hear me out, because some of you have been so under this title of identity that's been given to you, and you feel that's who I am, and I'm born this way, that you're not allowing, you're not allowing God's identity to prevail in your life. So just follow me as we go. Now, let me give you some of the, some of the genders and and sexual identities. Right now, heterosexual, we understand that. Homosexual, bisexual, pansexual, bicurious, polysexual, monosexual, polyamorous, monoamorous, gender fluid, agender, bigender, polygender. You say, what is this? These are all the new genders. And you know, they said, what, what, is, what is pansexual? When you're attracted to all genders. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, that sounds like trisexual. I'll try it all, right? <laughs> Monosexual means being attracted to only one gender. Polyamorous is an umbrella term referring to people who have or are open to have um, consens- consensual relationships with multiple people at the same time. Yeah, that was, we used to call that a player. <laughs> so we, just, we got other names for the girls that did it, but I just say. <laughs> but they have a little more scientific name for that now. Why, why all these identities? I'll tell you why this, all, all, all these identities. Because when we don't take on the identity of Christ, Satan will gladly give you an identity. And the problem is these identities will, can destroy, will destroy your life and can destroy your eternal existence, which is a big deal. And for some people, your identity has been your drug, you're an alcoholic, you're a drug addict, you're angry. It has to do with your emotions. You're, you're, you're angry, you're bipolar, you're fearful, you're full of anxiety. And, and, and you're, this is what the problem is is your symptom has become your identity. And I'm not saying that you can't have symptoms, but be careful that that doesn't become your number one definition of who you are because you were not created to be that. All right, we're, going, we're, we're, we're developing this. Now, back in, back in biblical days, they knew, who, they knew their identity. Believers were clear about their identity. They would say, some of this is who God says that I am, and I'm going to declare that over me. So this is what early believers would say. I am a new creation in Christ. And I want you to get this. Their identity was in their relationship with God. And they would say, I'm a, I'm a new creation in Christ. I, am no, I, am no long, I, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I am a child of God. I am his masterpiece created for good works. My life is hidden in Christ. I have been recreated in the likeness of God, truly righteous and holy. I am an essential member of the body of Christ. I am an heir of God. Since I am in Christ, I am no longer under condemnation and shame. The Holy Spirit lives in my body and my my body belongs to God. I am a citizen of heaven. I am redeemed by Jesus' blood. His forgiveness of all my, he's forgiven me of all my sins. 
and he's given me his grace. I am blessed by God with every spiritual blessing. I am fully satisfied in Christ. Jesus is the head of my life and I've given him full authority over me. I am chosen by Christ to bear fruit. I am more than a conqueror through Christ and we can continue. But they knew that our identity was in this relationship with Christ. We're living in a day that every single group that's identifying themselves is loud and proud. And it's time for Christians to stand up and be loud and proud of their identity with their Savior and their Lord, Jesus Christ. The only way to make an impact in this world is to be extreme. The world is extreme. We need some extreme believers. I'm not a casual Sunday Christian. I'm a 24-7, seven, seven days a week believer that is proud of his identity. My identity is not in my past. My identity is not, come on, my identity is not in my, my gender. I, I'm not male over I am a believer. My identity is not that I'm a Puerto Rican in my race. That's not my number one identity. My identity is not in my bank account. My identity is not in my career. My number one identity is in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I am a follower of Jesus. This is how we impact the world. So what I want to do is give you five statements. They're power statements. Um, and these statements are going to tell us about our identity and our relationship with him. What the Bible says about our identity and our relationship with God. And there's only two groups of people in this room. There are those that have a relationship with God and there are those that don't. And just because you've gone to church... And you could be serving in the church and even know the Bible doesn't mean you know God. So you could quote the Bible. It's just like you could sing the songs of your favorite artist and do all the dances on the video doesn't mean you know the artist. It's the same thing with being a believer or a Christian. You could be or, or a church member or an attender. You can know all the songs, know all the protocol, but it doesn't mean that you actually know God. So let's talk about our identity and our relationship with God. What does the Bible say about our identity and our relationship with God? I'm going to give you five statements. Write the statements down, study them, and I pray that you learn. Number one, we were created, created in the likeness of God to have a relationship with God. We were created to be like God, to be in relationship with God. You were created to have a relationship with God. This is review, Genesis 1, Then God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness. Not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. This is what God is, uh, God's original plan for every single one of us that we would be like him to be in relationship with him, that we would take on his identity. And it, see, so God originally created man um, to love like him, love like him, to be holy like him, to have peace and joy, to have his peace and joy and happiness in our lives. He created us to have his authority. He created us to be free like him, fulfilled like him, without sin like him, to be fruitful like him, to be creative like him, to be powerful like him, to be prosperous like him, to be healthy like him, to have eternal life like him. It's a quality of life that God has created us to live. So he created us in his likeness to be like him, to be in relationship with him. So let's cover the word image, image. It means resemblance. That means there should be some type of family resemblance. That means we should look like him. What's lately, what I've been noticing, we have our first grandbaby is Xander. And I'm looking at Xander grow up, 
and as, as I'm seeing Xander develop, Xander looks a lot like my daughter. My daughter has chubby cheeks, and Jan Xander has these chubby cheeks. It, he's, he, we saw a picture of Abriana when she was right around one years old, and it looks so much like the little baby that Gabriel is able to trick somebody and say, look at Xander. He goes, wow. And, but the picture was with us, and Robert was like 12 years old, right? And, and I was dressed totally different. And the guy said, why are they dressed like that? He goes, ah, they were just dressing like that. He goes, no, I'm just kidding. It's not Abriana, it's Xander. Now, what I mean by that is there should be some type of family resemblance that we believers should look like our Savior and our Lord and the one we're following. When, when this is what Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what he was saying is, is that I look like him. I say what he says because I only say what he says and I only do what I've seen him do. We as believers... This is what people should begin to see. They should begin to see the identity or the attributes or the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So resemblance also means representative. Is that we're his representative here on earth. It also means shadow. Shadow. Shadow means reflected image, inseparable companion. I have a daughter. Her name's Amarisa. And now she's probably around here somewhere. I don't know where she's at right now, but she's usually with my wife, Lisa. And everywhere Lisa goes, Amarisa is there. Amarisa is Lisa's shadow. I mean, Amarisa will follow Lisa all day long. Lisa goes to the garage, Amarisa's right there following her. Lisa goes to the bathroom, she's waiting literally at the door until Lisa comes out. Amarisa wants to go on date nights with me and Lisa. So I tell her, you can't go on the date night. She goes, that's not fair. And every week we have this big ordeal because Amarisa cannot go on date nights with us. But she wants to go. Once in a while, she's just jumping in the car where we're going. And that word shadow means inseparable companion. We were created inseparable companion with God. We were created to walk with God, to talk with God, to be like God. And I'll tell you this, when we take on his attributes, we're finally going to be the happiest we've ever been, the most fulfilled we've ever been, because we're finally taking on our preordained or predestined uh, say identity. You guys get this. So it's always been God's will that we be like God him or be like his son. Let's look at another scripture. And the, the point number two, it's always been God's will that we be like him, take on his identity. It is God's will that we be like Jesus, follow Jesus, be in agreement and unity with him and be close to him. And Romans 8, 29 says this, for he knew all about us before we were what? Born. When did he know about us? Before we were. That means your parents met you when you were born but God knew everything about you before you're born. You know what that means? Not one of you are an accident. And every single one of you, God has a destiny for. So you have, you have a predestination. Let's find out what it is. For he knew all about us before we were born. And he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. So what is, what is it, what's God's will for every one of us? that we be like his son, that we reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Look, let's read on. It says, this means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters. The scripture is describing this as a family, that we have an older brother, his name is Jesus, and he's the first of his kind, and, uh, and every other brother and sister will follow his lead and look like him. Look what it says here. The son is the oldest among the vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. So what's the goal? That we become just like Christ. And if you live life long enough and take on all kinds of identities, this is what you're going to find out. You go through all of them and you still find yourself empty. 
I heard something last night. I, I didn't watch the fight, but I watched the, the, um, the conference, the post-fight conference with Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson, they asked him, are you going to do it again? He goes, yes, I'm going to do it again. And this is what he said. He goes, I've, I've, I did the first part of my life, and it was all about me. It was all about the women. It was all about the drugs. It was all about the pride. It was all about my ego. It was all about the houses. It was all about the cars. He goes, and I found out that it left me absolutely empty. And he said this. I'm no longer that old Mike Tyson. I don't even like him. I want to do something that makes a difference in people's lives. Now, Mike Tyson is not a Christian, but this is what he's finding out. The only thing that he's found out that's rewarded him or made him feel good just a little bit is doing or being like Christ. He's finding out that what I want to do now is I want to, I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to make money and then invest it in the neighborhoods to help the young people and help the next generation. I go, you know, Mike, that's a good thing. It doesn't save them, but he's realizing that the most enjoyable, the, the greatest place he could ever be is going back to the original identity. He's close. He's close because he's taken on the attributes of Christ. Now he needs to receive Christ. I want you to understand that. He's saying, this is what makes me actually feel better. But listen, so God has a destination. All of us to be like him. Number three, living like Christ is proof that we have an intimate relationship with God. We are like the ones we love, follow, and lives inside of us. Those that have a relationship with God take on the identity, of, uh, the identity of God. Have you ever seen this, that you start hanging around people and you start talking like them? You start dressing like them? I can't even go to Texas without starting to talk like a Texas twang. I just start, I just start yeah, I'll, I'll take some hamburgers and fries with that. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Mount California. You sound like you're from these parts. Well, I am kind of from these parts. Since I've been here, I just can't stop talking like this. And then and if some of you guys were gangsters, and you start talking like them. You didn't talk like them. Oralip West, what's up, SA? You, you, didn't, you weren't born talking like that. But you started looking and talking like the people you're with. So how we know you have a close relationship, intimate relationship with God, you start looking like him. You start talking like him. You start loving the things that he loves. Your desires begin to change. Isn't that true? And that's why having good friends and godly friends is important because you become like the people you're hanging with. Right? But look at the scripture. Look at this verse. In 1 John 2, 4, we read the scripture. If someone claims... I know him well. Someone's claiming, I know God really well. Okay. But doesn't keep his commandments. He's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. So if someone says, I love God, but still does it his way. That means I don't do it God's way. I disagree with his philosophy of living. I won't do it God's way. What he's saying is, you could be saying you love God or that you know him. And you have an intimate relationship with him. But what the scripture is saying, it's not true. You're lying to yourself and lying to everyone around you. Because if you're breaking the commands of God, you really don't know him and you really don't love him. That's interesting. Let's keep looking at the scripture. It says, but the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is a person that really loves God. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Someone say, be sure you're in God. It's the only way to know. Anyone who claims to be, in, to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life Jesus lived. So how do we know we have an intimate relationship with God? We, become, we start living the life of Christ. We start looking like the one we love the one we're following, and the one we're spending time with. I have good news for you. You might be saying, Pastor, I, I don't think I've been resembling. I don't think I've been representing. 
I don't think I've been a shadow of Christ. And maybe that's why I'm empty. And maybe that's why I feel like there's something missing in my life. And it could be, it's your identity. You found your identity with the wrong group. And God's talking to you and he's talking to me today. And he's saying, I created you to have an identity, but your identity is supposed to be in me. Stop searching. You know, I, I love sports and I love all that stuff. But my number one identity is the Lord. How many understand that? I watched a Raider game yesterday and they lost, but that was a great game though. You know, but... The Raiders lost, but it doesn't ruin my life because it's not my identity. <laughs> I, 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 like the, I would like the Raiders to win. That was great over KC for sure. You know, but, but, but that's not my identity. My identity is in Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and my goal is to be just like him. And the more I'm like him, the happier I am, the more joy I have, the more prosperous I am, prosperous I am the more power I walk in, the more I'm like him, the more effective I am. So the goal is to be like him. And the proof that we have an intimate relationship with God is we're becoming more like him. Number four. Living a life of sin makes us, makes us like the devil, not like Christ. We take on the devil's identity when we live a life of sin. What I mean by that is it makes us, makes us angry like him, selfish like him, hate, hateful like him, liars like him, lustful like him, deceived and deceitful like him, unfaithful like him, hopeless like him, perverted like him, condemned like him. The devil wants us to take on his identity. Now, Jesus was saying this one day because it was a group of religious people. Maybe they just came from church and they were claiming to be followers of God and then Jesus blew their minds by what he said. And look at John, John 8, 44 says this. For you are the children of your father, the devil. And what he's saying here is Satan is your daddy. And how do we know this? And you love to do the evil things he does. How do we know Satan's your daddy? You like to do what he does. He's your father. Now this scripture is Jesus spoken. And what he was saying in every room, in every place, either God, the creator of the heavens and the earth is your father or the devil's your father. Oh, look at what the scripture says. It's getting quiet in here today. Look at this. And you love to do the things he does. He was always hated. He always hated the truth because there was no truth in him. This is what happens when we're being led or we have the identity of, of the devil in our lives. When we hear truth, we get angry. A matter of fact, we hate it. I can't believe that he talked about my identity. Because what's happening, you're trying to hold on to that identity. So there's something within you that's fighting against the word. It's fighting against the truth. Like, I hate it. Someone's coming today and saying, man, that's what I needed. I need it right now to focus on my identity. I've been confused. I've been using my boyfriend as my identity. My girlfriend as my identity. My job as my identity. The thing with my identity. My looks as my identity. Uh, by being a vegan as my identity. Being a vegetarian as my identity. Uh, I've, I've been using my sexuality as my identity. And I'm lost. And I'm confused. And I'm empty. I'm so glad I heard this word. I'm going to stop fighting against it. I need change in my life. And maybe the thing that I'm missing is my true identity. But then there's somebody else that hates it. When, look at this, when the, when the devil lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. From the beginning of time, Satan has been trying to change our identity that God created us to live. When God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve to be like him. Just like him, he created him create Adam and Eve in his image, in character, in, in personality, in love. Saying, what did he do? He told Eve, if you eat of that tree, you're going to be like God. What a lie. They were already like God. He was making them think they were missing something. They weren't missing anything. They were already like God. And when they ate of the tree, 
they did not become like God. Their kids did not become like God. They actually became like Satan. The next group, the two kids that he had, the identity of Christ or identity of God or the image of God did not, was not produced in the next generation. The next generation, Cain ended up killing his brother, Abel. Murder happened with the first family. Two brothers, one of them killed another brother. And where did it start? When Eve took on the identity and Adam took on the identity of the enemy, mistrusting God, and then it followed into their children. Now I'm going to tell you this. We need, since we have an identity crisis in this world, this is, we're identifying with our dysfunction. We're identifying with our sins. We're identifying with our lust. We're identifying with our past. We're identifying with our family lineage. This is a problem. We're passing on the wrong identity to the next generation. And this, the only way to pass on the identity of Christ to your children, and it could start right now, is through the power of God's Spirit living in you and you allowing Christ to live through you that people start seeing, starting in our home, the image of God in our lives, in our conversations, in our decisions, that they would realize, Mama, you used to be a diff you're different. I don't know what's happened to you. And you tell them, I, you know what's different? I used to be a drug addict. I used to be a liar. I used to sleep around with every guy if they just give me a little money to pay my bills. But I'm done with that life. I made up my mind. I'm going to live for God. And what you're seeing now is the power of God in my life. Give God a little bit of praise. Come on. Let them see change in your life. And number five, this is it. I want you, this is a very key, key point. Only through the Holy Spirit can we be like Christ and have a relationship with him. The Holy Spirit produces the character and identity of Christ in us. We can't be godly without God's spirit. We can't be godly without what? It is not, it's not by my, no by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. We can't be like God through our own willpower or self-discipline, but only by being empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm making, a, I'm making a big, big statement here. Because if you try to be godly without God, that's called religion. Because it's law with no power. And all it does is take you to a place, it's standards without the power to live up to them. And all it will do is make you feel like a failure because the standards are too high. This is why we need forgiveness and we need the power of God's spirit. God will never ask you to do something he will not empower you to do. So if I have an attitude with my wife, I can't say, and it's a, it's an ungodly attitude. I can't just say, honey, that's just the way I am, and you made me angry. It's your fault. No, I need to take personal responsibility because I have the Holy Spirit in me, and since I have the Holy Spirit in me, I could produce patience. I can be patient. If you're single, you can control your lustful passions. Well, I just can't help myself. I'm a male. <laughs> and what you're doing is lowering yourself to the status of a dog. You're in heat and you can't help yourself. You're not a dog. And I know in the rap songs they made you a dog. Who let the dogs out and all that stuff? <laughs> Snoop Dogg. What's up, dog? We started calling ourselves dogs, and I don't think that was an accident. I think it was demonic. That you're a beast and you have no control over your actions. You have no control over your sexuality. You have no control over your passions. You're a dog, dog. And then, and then in the rap songs, they started calling girls bees, female dogs. And some of us in this room are playing music that has those words in it, and you're like, 
B. You're nothing but a B. You're nothing but a blank, 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 blank. F, F. And the reason I'm saying that is because the enemy is doing everything he can to destroy our identity. And what God is saying, you're not a dog. You're not a bee. You, this is who you are. I've created you to be like me. I've created you to take on my identity. My identity, your identity is a, come on, you're a son and daughter of the most high. You're a son and daughter of God. You are more than a conqueror. Okay, we need the Holy Spirit. What do we need? I got carried away there for a minute. But you know, maybe it's going to help someone. You're struggling with your identity because you've, you've been listening to too much nonsense. And it's messing with your thinking. Because what you're exposing yourself to is demonic stuff. You know, so interesting in a fight yesterday. That between the fights they had, they have vulgar music. You know, it's rappers singing about this and promoting weed and smoking blunts. And, and we're like, looking at it. Some people turned it off good. But some people just listened to it. Oh, I like that beat. And you know what's crazy? Because you expose yourself to that beat, you woke up in the morning with that beat on your mind. And you started in the morning with the wrong beat and the wrong words. Cuss words are coming, just thoughts. You're not saying them, but they're now just floating in your mind because of what you expose yourself to. And just like Eve exposed herself to just a serpent for a little conversation, you expose yourself to some music. And what it's doing is messing with your thinking. It's messing with your identity. And the problem is you're, all that stuff is leaving you empty. And you're wondering, why am I so empty? I remember, because I, I, I love music. And I used to have back in the day cassettes. You guys remember cassettes? You guys don't even know about that. That's old school stuff. So I had a cassette player in my car. And I had all kinds of music in that car. And I, I you know what I had? I had a home speaker. Like, you remember those big, huge home speakers? I had it in the back of my seat. Not even, I had a truck, but it wasn't in the trunk. It was in, in the cab with me. And I had a little mini truck. And I was like, like this. But I had my music and bumping. And then when I played that music, I took on the identity of that music. If it was violent, I wanted to fight everybody. I was mad dog. And... <laughs> oh, grandma at the start, like, what? <laughs> you guys remember that? And if it was a love song, I'm something romantic and lustful, like, always and forever with my girlfriend at. For... Let me sing you this song, honey. But you would, take, you would take on the identity of the music. And, and this is how the enemy works. Exposure affects your character and your identity. And it's time for us to expose ourselves to God. To expose ourselves to the word. I'm so glad that you're here today exposing yourself to the word of God and finding out your identity. But let's finish this scripture. Acts 2, 20, 38. And Peter said... Repent, change your old way of thinking, and turn from your sinful ways. Accept and follow Jesus as a Messiah. Let's just look at this. And this is the point I'm making. The Holy Spirit is a gift that is received after repentance of sin. So there has to be a day that you change your identity for God's identity. I, I finally have to, there's no such thing as a Christian gangster. I'm trying to figure this out. There you go. You still want to represent West Side, South Side, your neighborhood, but you want to live for God. You're going to have to renounce your hood. You're going to have to renounce your old identity. You're going to have to renounce your born sexual, the, the, the sexuality. You have to, born, come on, uh, renounce the lifestyle you've been living because you're identifying yourself as that. And that's why sometimes with Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a little trouble with it. Only because you confess over yourself, and I understand the reason I am an alcoholic, and I, and I think I, I think the better confession is I've been set free 
from the identity of alcoholism. I'm a new creation in Christ. I was an alcoholic, but that's not who I am anymore. I'd rather that. I'm not putting down alcoholics and I'm just, there's a higher confession and I think that we need to look at that. But look at this. So what do we do? We renounce our old identity and be baptized, each of you. So after you say, I'm done with that lifestyle, what's your next step? Baptism. What does baptism represent? It represents death, burial. Burial of what? My old identity. I'm done with that. And what's coming out of the water represents? Your new identity. I used to live for myself and the devil. That was who I was. I'm not that person anymore. I'm coming out of the water. My identity's in Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. I, I follow Christ till the day I die. I'm no longer the person I used to be. It's, someone say decision. And then, then you're forgiven of your sins. And then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you receive what? Until you have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. There's no way to be saved without God's Spirit coming inside of your life. Being born again is actually a spiritual moment. God actually comes, His Spirit, and I would say, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus comes and lives inside of you. If the Spirit of Jesus, the creator of the universe, comes and lives inside of you, should it cause change in your desires and change in your identity and change in your thinking and change in your behavior? It should, right? The change happens after we receive the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, this is a problem. We'll try to change, but we won't have the power or the desire to change. How I know someone's not changed, they have no desire to do what's right. They want to continue. As a matter of fact, doing right is a burden on them. But when you're changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, doing wrong is a burden on you. Because when you fall, you hate it. I don't love it. That's not me. That's not who I am. I'm done with that lifestyle, and you ask God forgiveness, he forgives your sins, he cleanses you, and you get right back up and say, no, I'm going to live for God. That failure, that drug, that pornography is not who I am. I am a new creation in Christ, and I'm going to live for him. I'm not letting my fall give me my identity. I rise up because the Spirit of God is in me. I will fight that thing till the day I die and I will not let it take over who I am and who I've been created to be. Come on, give God some praise. That's who I am. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that produces the character, the character and the personality and identity of Christ. It's the spirit that produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. It's the spirit of God that produces that. But I can't produce that without the spirit of God. So your first step is say, God, I want to I start living that identity. Because God did not create you to be depressed, to be bound to be full of fear, to remain brokenhearted, to feel unworthy, to be rejected, to be abused, to be lost for eternity. God did not create you to live that kind of life. And if you're living that kind of life, you have an identity crisis. But I got good news for you. The one that died for you and resurrected from the dead to give you new life, he's here today. And he loves you. And if you're willing to exchange your identity for you know, your new identity in Christ, you could become a brand new person today and finally live the life you're predestined to live. You were created to live and be like God through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's give God some praise. If you receive that word, just say amen. amen. Pastor Rob, please close us out. Yes, how many received that word today? Wasn't that great? What is missing is our identity in Christ. Now, if you're here today or maybe you're watching online, 
This is kind of like the old saying where the rubber meets the road right now. This is where the rubber meets the road. We get an opportunity at this moment to react on the word that we just heard. We get an opportunity now to make a move. Make a move on what, Pastor? On that last scripture that we read. To repent of our sins and turn to God. If you're here today and, man, life's been so tough. Maybe you became even an addict. Maybe you're here and you're an addict right now. Hey, you never thought that you'd be dealing with alcohol or even cigarettes or drugs or pornography and all these things. You're saying, man, I know I wasn't created for this. I was created in God's image. And today I want to get back on the image. I want to become like God. I want to repent of my sins. I want to receive forgiveness of everything I've done. How many have ever done anything wrong? How many done something wrong today? <laughs> right? Right? That's who we are. We, we've made mistakes. But here's the coolest thing of all. Jesus came to pay the price over every sin you and I have ever done. We could be forgiven today. You could walk out of this auditorium a brand new person today. Today your name could get written in the Lamb's book of life. Pastor, what is that? When you and I die, one day you and I will die. We're going to pass away. We're going to stand before Jesus. They're going to open up a book that's called the Lamb's book of life. They're going to open up this book. Jesus himself is going to open up this book. Every name that's not recorded in that book, the Bible says they get cast into the lake of fire. Now, here's the good news. For every person, every name that's recorded in the book, they get eternal life with Jesus. Pastor, how do I get my name in that book? Here it goes. All you have to do is this last thing, the scripture, the last scripture we just read. Repent of your sins and turn to God. So if you're, if you're in this room today or maybe you're online watching and you're saying, Pastor, I want my name in that book. I want my identity to change today. I want to be set free of every addiction that I'm a part of right now. I want to become a child of God. I want everybody to stand up at this time. And if you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want to be forgiven of all my sins. I want to make sure if I died today, they would open up this book. And here's the question today. Pay close attention. Is your name in that book? Have you given your life to Jesus yet? We're not talking about a church. We're not talking about a religion. Pastor Marco said it earlier. We're talking about a relationship with Christ. So if you're in this room, you're online, you're saying, man, my heart's starting to pound right now. I want my new identity. And I want to be forgiven of all my sins. Man, I want to make sure if I died, my name is in that book. I want to go to heaven with Christ. I want to be set free from all of my addictions. I know that's not who I'm supposed to be. I want to be set free today. I want to go extreme for God. I love that. We need to start a series on that, extreme for God. I want to go extreme right now. I want to give everything to God. If that is you, I want you to slip your hands up when I count to three. Don't let nothing hold your hand down. Forget about the person next to you for a second. This is you and God right now. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to be set free. He wants you to get you back into his image. If that is you, raise your hands when I count to three. One, two, three. Right now, raise your hands all across this auditorium. I want Jesus. I want to be forgiven. I want that new identity. I want to be set free from addictions. I want to go all out. I want to go, I want to go extreme for God. I see that hand. See hands in the back. See a hand there. Now all those who just raised your hands. I want you to come forward. Come meet me down here at the altar, here in the front section. 
and we're going to pray with you right now to repent of your sins and to turn to God and receive your new identity in Christ. Come on down. As they come down, you guys give them a big shout of support. Come, come. This is your day. This is your day. Run to the altar. Say, I want Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Come, 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 come. Yes, come, sweetie. Yes, come, come, come. Come, come. Come on, church, get round of applause. It's still coming, come. There will be breakthrough. Your yes. power. Come give your life to Jesus. Your come. Break strongholds. King of heaven. Come, come, come. Yes, come on down. Got a few more. Come on down. Come on down. Wow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. Give Jesus a shout of praise. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Every one of you. God loves you. Before you were born, some of you, there's even someone up here that your mom told you were an accident. And God says, no, you weren't. Because before you were born, I knew you and had a plan for your life. But since you were born, there's been an enemy that's been chasing after you to hurt you, destroy you abuse you manipulate you and it gets you to try to fix your pain a boy came and says I can fix your loneliness come with me he just took advantage of you your buddies say hey why don't you be part of our crew we could do some damage together and you join them and you found out when it was all said and done they're all gone and when you needed them most, they weren't there. When it went down, you went to prison. Where are they at? It was all fake. But there's a God that died for you. Jesus, God, he died for you. He loves you that much to have a relationship with you. And all he's asking, say, what does God want from me? You willing to give up your identity, your pain, your hurt, your depression, your lifestyle, say, exchange that identity and I'll give you your true identity. Let me give it to you. I'll give you your integrity get back, your character back, your freedom back, your honor back, your purpose back, your vision back, your joy back, your peace back, your sleep back. You're going to get it back. And then we can start building a life. Because when we're on the devil's plan we're on a plan of self-destruction and instead of getting filled with the spirit of God we're getting filled with spirits fear unworthiness rejection hurt abuse anger and today Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil every single work of the devil he's destroying right now in your life get ready for Get ready. God's ready to set you free. Let's pray, Robert. Yes. And everybody here in the front or at your seats, we're going to say this prayer right now. And the scripture we just read in Acts, it says, repent and turn. Then the next step is to get baptized. So after we get them praying, everybody here in the front, we have some altar workers here, some, some coaches. Talk for a few minutes and ask, have you been baptized? sign up for baptism today maybe you're at your seat you're saying man you know what i i've said that prayer but i haven't gone to the next step i haven't got baptized yet once we repent and turn we get baptized what did the scripture say now we get the gift of the holy spirit that's the only way to live for christ so sign up for baptism maybe you're at your seats you'll come up talk to one of us up here we'll sign you for baptism our discipleship classes and you'll go to the next step Everyone, if we can, bow their head and close their eyes. 
You're online right now. Get ready to say this prayer with us. Bow your head right there in your living room. Bow your head. You're here today. You didn't come up. You say, man, I need to say this as well. Say it right there at your seat. Let's say it corporately together. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I repent of all my sins. And I turn to you, God. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today I put my faith in you. Today I am saved. I am born again. Holy Spirit, fill me. Set me free from all bad habits, all addictions, all generational curses. For who the Son sets free is free indeed. I receive my identity in you, Jesus. I am saved. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just said that prayer, welcome to the family of Christ online. I got saved. It'll walk you through the steps for the next journey of your life.